Well, hello, folks, and welcome to this episode of the Astrology University podcast. I am joined by uh, two amazing astrologers today, Frank Clifford and Mark Jones. And we're here to talk a little bit about the upcoming summit that we have at Astrology University called 2020 Epic Cycles of Change and Renewal. And that summit will be broadcast on April 13th and 14th, 2019. If you're listening to the podcast episode after that, you can still uh, get the summit. Just head over to astrologyuniversity.com forward slash summit and you'll find all of the details there. Um, but Frank and uh, Mark are with me today to talk a little, little bit about uh, kind of the greater ideas behind the summit because in the summit we're going to be looking forward at some cycles coming up some big uh, we're calling them epic cycles of change uh, coming up in 2020 we're looking at this uh, configuration of heavy configuration of planets in Capricorn in the lead up to the uh, grand conjunction in of Jupiter and Saturn at the end of 2020 in Aquarius as the planets shift into Aquarius and so a lot of astrologers in the summit will be talking um, about uh, forecasting and prediction and and um, cycles that are unfolding in the future and what we can make of them. And so I thought we would talk today a little bit about um, why we do that and what we think we can accomplish by doing that and how much insight we think astrology can give into the future. So um, with that, I'll just say uh, hello to Frank and Mark. And <clears throat> I'm not sure if either of you would like to just jump in and start talking about that one, but <clears throat> thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Thank Tony. You, I guess we should have picked who goes first. <laughs> I'm an Aries. I'm very happy to allow the okay. Pisces to go first. <laughs> yeah. Just this once. Okay. Just this once. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know about the people in this room, but I was drawn to astrology at a point in my life where I didn't know WTF really, you know, what's going on, where am I going? And we're all drawn there, aren't we? Because it's a system of knowledge that at least includes the idea that it might give you some kind of angle on life or some kind of take on the future. So certainly that's where I started. But the longer and deeper I go into astrology, the more I'm suspicious of that aspect of my own mind, my own heart, you know, my own need to have my life explained to me or mapped out or someone else other than my good self to you know tell me hold my hand or tell me the future or and yet it's the impulse that led me into it and clearly astrology does have something to say in, in that regard clearly astrology and its symbolism is very rich and does point to certain collective and individual trends and that evidence would show are statistically real the very people the french scientist who came in to disprove astrology ends up dedicating um, books and parts of his research to sections of astrological thought because he finds on a statistical analysis it it does have some efficacy so but i i for one live my life better when i feel like my intuition or my heart and my mind are clear and i make decisions i'm not one who's staring at the chart every day you know or looking at the micro transits to wonder if i remember traveling once with a canadian novelist um, around parts of america and he would check when he was going to go to the coffee shop you know it was a mercury venus sextile at 10 a.m that morning he was going to the coffee shop no matter what because of his little pocket ephemeris that's not me that's not the way i live it really isn't and but i think with these larger cycles we have to come to terms i mean they fascinated someone like Jung. they fascinated great minds the, the symbolism of changing of eras or the, the symbolism of changes in humanity and many people feel like we're in some kind of transition time right now it feels like that, doesn't it? Our actual subjective experience when we turn the television on or hear the news or something's afoot. Can astrology help us orientate in a way that's empowering to that, in a way that doesn't take away agency from the individual human? I hope so. I, I don't always see that, but I, that's my intention with it, at least. Yes, I mean, I agree. I think um, the idea of uh, recognizing the season you're in. I always talk about seasons uh, and co-creating who you want to be. I think um, we can be too too easily defined by our chart and limited by our chart. And our chart is a, a blueprint for who we are, but it's not always uh, necessarily who we become or um, we operate on many levels. 
I always think that we're bigger than our birth charts. I think the birth chart reflects uh, an aspect of what we signed up to do, but uh, we meet hundreds of people in our lifetime who have other birth charts, other ideas, other focuses, and it brings out different aspects of who we are. Uh, so um, in a way, yes, I think we are bigger than our chart and we should use the cycles that are coming up as signposts for where we want to be or just to realign, to remind ourselves of the, the key principles in our lives, the energies that we hold. We call them planets and signs or we call them principles of who we are. And um, they're, they're great reminders uh, to get back on track, to remember what we're here to do or to do something different. Uh, so um, in a way, uh, I don't ever see them as, as um, fait accompli or an idea of just, this is what's going to happen to me. I think this is where we, we get unstuck if we think, um, we think in those terms. Yeah. Well, I mean, profound. And to me, the sense that we're larger than the chart is, is you can be very specific in one way and say that the essence of an individual is in their heart and mind or their core nature. It's in their being. Mm. I would argue it's an ontological error. It's a philosophical category error to ascribe to astrology a degree of reality that only being has. You know, it's your life that matters. It's Frank's life. It's Mark's life. And is the chart something that opens a portal onto that life and increases that life or is it something that could imprison it potentially because it seems to me a chart's like a sonnet of you you know maybe the greatest reader maybe the greatest literary interpreter maybe shakespeare himself reading it sees through to a greater truth but many people read sonnets and they read them quite leaden in a leaden fashion or they they literalize the meaning of the you know the fantastic mellifluous words and I think there's a danger of doing that with astrology all the time, making an imprisoning category of knowing like you're defined because Venus is in such and such a place. You're like this in relationships. Well, are you? Has that been tested? And then Venus is in a context of infinite subtlety. Venus is in all these other different relationships with all these other different planets that will change the way it operates. So I would always argue for weighing life experience, you know, and the richness of personal wisdom against astrology as, as being too literal an interpretation of people's lives but i do agree like frank said they do signpost things you know that it's not that astrology is not effective it's just way more subtle it seems to me because life is way more subtle mm. than most people would like you know people we want our complexity reduced don't we that's why people are attracted to black and white fundamentalist faiths i think they want the complexity of the world to be reduced to a simplistic moral order and there's a danger of that tendency with astrology too, to turn it into something too simple when life's not simple, people aren't simple, you know? You could imagine um, sort of a, a, a tri-wheel, you know, we're the outer wheel, we're larger than the chart. The chart is the next wheel in, and then you maybe got a, quite a small wheel in the center that is the astrologer's ability to convey. <laughs> yeah, love it, love it. Yes. Love it. That's brilliant, so, that's you know, brilliant. Well, that's the thing about astrology. You've got um, maybe a capacity of 100 words to describe a planet, um, 100 words to describe a sign or an aspect or a house. And yet we're so much bigger than that. And life is so much bigger than that. And the chart is somewhere in between the, the astrologer's ability to describe it and our real experience of living on multidimensional uh, levels. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's tri superb. <laughs> I love that use of triwheel. I just love it. I, I think it identifies two primary errors, just to underline it. The fact that the outer wheel, the biggest wheel, is your life experience, and that even the greatest reading of the symbolic potential of the charts, only a section of that, that there's an element of your personal being that will always be mysterious, that, that isn't actually necessarily elucidated in conceptual terms ever. You know, you only reach that part by living your life. You know, the richness of grief or losing someone you love and coming through that. Can that be described by a Saturn transit or a Pluto transit? Not really. It might be uh, bookended by it, but it's not the same thing as what happens to you. And then this level where, and people are students, people are beginners and they need to learn and they, and they want simple definitions. They want A equals one, B equals two. They want Aries equals this, Taurus equals that in order to learn. But we have to teach 
quickly, it seems to me, that these kind of Lego building blocks are too simple and that they only work in the subtlety of context, the, the rainbow of associations they make. Because otherwise the danger is astrologers are reading this, t that, that tiny inner wheel, which really is tiny sometimes, mm -hmm. and is a conceptual trap, not just of the person's larger, greater being at the outer wheel, but even the potential of what astrology could have offered them in the middle level, if it was held more subtly. And if the astrologer was listening to that greater outer wheel and, and letting the astrology move and be more freeform as a result, mm. such a great image that Frank, brilliant, love that. Thank you, I, I mean, the, also the idea that, um, uh, yes, it's, it's a funny one because people add so much more to the horoscope at times. And you know, people, if I would say to students, if you can articulate Sedna, throw it in and talk to somebody about it because you'll get the clients that need Sedna articulated in their chart. Um, the rest of us might not need it or, or the rest of us astrologers may not need to interpret it or, or describe it. Um, but the more you add to a chart, um, it actually has the reverse function of um, it just ends up clouding the matter. Often. Exactly. Yeah. This is my great paradox on the subject I'm speaking of, Tony, for your telesummit and writing on in that for years I've taught strip the chart back to its bare essentials because there's enough there to be rich if you, if you learn to read it subtly and with that symbolic resonance. And here I am at this point in my development as an astrologer introducing a subject that is relatively new to most people. I mean, it did preoccupy Dane Rudyard for the latter decades of his life. And he did go on record saying he thought it was the most important thing he was working on. But at the same time, I'm introducing these other points, these nodal points. Luckily, they're relatively simple ones, technically, to discover. But it's a lot to ask, and it's why I switched. We were talking before we started, weren't we, Tony, about the editorial decision you took years ago when I was presenting the first work that became Healing the Soul, Pluto, Uranus, and the Lunar Nodes, to remove all the stuff on planetary nodes, because it was a mess. And what it's produced in the meantime is a decade of research has led to this research-based form because frank i'm so aware of what you just said it's like i've had to study it for the last few thousand years of history in detail to show for example the 9 11 attacks occurred with the pluto saturn opposition as a signpost but that pluto saturn opposition pluto in sag saturn in gemini occurred on the nodes of uranus which when you look historically the Hiroshima chart midheaven is the node of Uranus. The first time that tanks are used in warfare, it's the nodes of Uranus. So technical explosions of meaning, sometimes very traumatic, come into the world with these nodes. And it's linked to that South Node Sagittarius theme of fundamentalism or vision. And here we have, so all that writing around the time of the Twin Towers attack on the astrology, the incredible astrology of this Pluto, Sag, Saturn opposition but no one spoke about the nodes of Uranus, which were prominent in Rudyard's chart himself, natally, and one of the reasons why he was investigating them. When you look at collective events like that, and they're so transcribed by certain astrological signatures, mm. it's the one time in my career for a man who has almost campaigned on the basis of strip astrology back and listen more to people's reality than the astrology, where I'm introducing these ideas that aren't really technically new in the late 60s and early 70s they were being studied by Rudyard and Zip Dobbins and um, Carl Payne Toby picked them up and various people like that but they are new and I and, and yet I am a person who profoundly agrees with Frank and what you just said like strip the chart back don't waste your time on all these extra things in it because people have a magpie mind and they 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 haven't grasped the core parts of the chart and then they're rushing to put in new information. Yeah. And then in danger of that, here I am introducing these new ideas, but hopefully I, I'm going to do so in a book which is so research-based with such context that it, it provides it in a way that we don't just destabilize or use it in that way. But obviously it's a risk and it's something I spend the whole introduction discussing. Um, yeah, one of the paradoxes, I guess, in your own growth sometimes that you come against <laughs> even your own ideas that you follow yeah. and oh, you yeah. move them on. Yeah. yeah, I think it's important to include what speaks to you and yes. not miss anything. Um, and I'm a great fan of using the outer planets, of course. I think I like to see my TV, my um, Netflix in color rather than black yes. and white. <laughs> yes, yes. 
and, uh, <laughs> you know, and yeah, nice I mean, image. You know, sometimes the um, the new the new planets, um, the new discoveries are like the uh, high definition, and they yeah. do they do help you zoom in. Um, but I've seen over the years, I've been in astrology 30 years this year, and I've, I've seen over the years people rush in to, um, uh, to holding on to a particular planet. But back when I started, it was Chiron. Everybody was holding on to their wound. And, yes. um, and you know, I totally respect their, their choice to do that. But it, they, they were, um, it, it, was, it was comforting um, rather than helping them evolve, it was comforting to say, "Well, I have a moon Chiron, therefore I am." You know, yeah. Instead of uh, instead of seeing it as a as another aspect of who they are, and maybe an aspect towards being a better version of who they are, rather than uh, an opportunity to blame or to to stay with that. Yes, um, yes. This this what you're saying is so profound. It, it, I mean, it's always been the area where you and I have such a shared vision i think it led to dialogues didn't it really mm -hmm. this feeling we have about this the way astrology is held in this way because i just couldn't agree more i i often teach this idea that it's a category error philosophically to ascribe reality to astrology astrology is just like a map you know the the map of the grand canyon does not have the reality the grand canyon does the map's just an orientation tool well that's how i see the chart mm -hmm. and then people will be like great talk really love it and then you'll be out in the conference and they'll be like yeah someone will say oh something happened to you oh yeah this relationship changed happened it was really difficult oh i'm sorry to hear that oh yeah it's because such and such is on such and such or it's because my such and such is in such and such we we hold on to these things as if they explain our life's travise and suffering and and i'm not sure they do i'm not sure it's good enough to hold on to astrology like that to make it real it's a it's a or it it's a way that astrology can victimize it's students and practitioners actually this holding on you know my moon chiron therefore i am you know? yeah and i think also that um to the outsider it sounds uh very peculiar i mean it, it really uh it really doesn't i remember when um i forget his name i think it's brian cox the um uh, the scientist in uh, the pop singer turned scientist in england um uh, started his wonders of the solar system that do you remember that tv series yeah, that was on yeah. and uh, people were raving about him for the first week and in week two he said of course astrology is a load of rubbish and of course they um everyone got upset with him for saying that and what was fascinating is that somebody wrote him a letter telling him why he had that world view and they mentioned his saturn square this and Sessu quadrate this and whatever. And I read the letter and I, I just shivered uh, because it was precisely what he was expecting to hear. A little bit like Dawkins as well. You know, when you, uh, when you research God, you're not going to go to the people that are truly moved by yes. God. You can talk to the evangelists yes. who, are, who are bringing in $50 million a year and people are being uh, seduced into it. You're never going to go to the real spiritual places in the world. You're going to just be attracted to where um, perhaps the more sensational or more naive qualities are going to, are, are to be found. Um, I think this is so astute. Both of those points are so astute. I mean, I thought that at Dawkins multiple times. Mm. Um, he picks, basically, people believe that the Bible is a literal timeline. And then he deconstructs them, which is no real response to the religious function of the psyche, as Jung would call it, or, or the spiritual impulse in mankind. And then this point about how people must perceive us as a community. There's this general feeling, isn't it, that we're super Uranian and somehow the Saturn normal world is just too unhip to get astrology. And yet there's this counter view that goes, we're developing this weird special language that we hold on to sometimes as if it explains all our life issues, which it doesn't in that way. And people are naturally sensible, intelligent people in academia or solicitors or doctors are a bit like, really? And they maybe have got a point. And I just don't think it's simple. I don't think we always translate well as a profession like that when we have these micro concerns. And of course, compared to much like newspaper, sun sign astrology, which is what lots of people's only exposure will have been, um, the idea that you're a theoretical physicist probably counts in his mind quite a lot higher, you know, and who can blame him on some level, you know, really. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's good to see, I mean, Frank, you're like your name in these moments. You're so frank. 
and it's it's really good I, it makes me feel super refreshed and positive about the future of our community when you a very well powerful presence in it are so clear on these kinds of points it, I, I really well i, love I don't it. know uh, thank you i mean i don't know how clear i am i just know that there's more than the chart and for example we the one thing that you have to explain to students early on is that um, not everybody in, God forbid, a plane crash of 300 people is going to have a um, an aspect in their chart that would suggest death. And you have to explain there are bigger things going on, that a chart uh, could be similar to yours, but in war-torn Sudan. Yes, or, exactly. Or and really it's not getting the water for that seed to develop. And so the chart has limits and it has an opportunity where um, if, you're, if you're a man with the moon rising in cancer and you're in a particular time when, uh, or society where men don't cry or the family are very Saturnian, um, you're not going to get a chance to develop that part of your chart. And so you know, there are all sorts of uh, questions here along with... Um, uh, in, particularly in terms of forecasting or what sort of uh, tree you develop into from a particular seed. Um, and it's, it's tough explaining that to students because students come along really wanting you to be able to forecast or wanting to be able to um, see that they can be successful or they read that planets in the 10th house will do that for them. And then you show them half a dozen charts of amazing career professionals who've got nothing that you read in the books. So it's a continual uh, development um, and understanding that it's not, we are bigger than our charts and our lives are impacted far more than, than just simply by transits or directions. Uh, and it's impacted by society and everybody around us with their own charts, with their own uses uh, and, and behaviors. Very profound. That conditioning factor is just so crucial, isn't it? When you were talking, I imagined, in a way, reality is like an infinitely complex, non-linear field of information. It literally is so interdependent, it just changes, like flashes like that. And the mind is linear, fundamentally. Students coming to an astrology school wanting to know the building blocks of a chart, they want linear explanations. But that will only go so far to do life justice. I mean, generations of people took stones and made the great cathedrals of the world, which are arguably the most beautiful expression of man's cultural time on this planet certainly some of the most ornate when three generations of men carved the same pulpit out of stone or something it's like even even when you refine it that much it still only can capture some of the magic of reality and i think that's what we're playing against the, the sheer complexity and mystery of the world which is a part of its beauty and you try to rob it of its beauty you're like the butterfly collector you know, mm -hmm. who kills things so you can study their wings if you push astrology too far like that. And I, I did an article recently on the aspects to the sun. I did this for Astro University last year and um, uh, decided to turn it into an article for the Mountain Astrologer. And I put at the end that um, the idea of even talking about your son in your chart and the mission, the vocation, is a privilege that over 80% of the world don't have an opportunity to even consider because they're, they're literally below the poverty line or starving. So the idea that we're sitting around saying, well, what am I going to do with myself? Because I'm, I've got the sun square Neptune and maybe that might be problematic or whatever. Um, and you think about how small a, 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 um, a a percentage of the population has the ability yes. to, to sort of first, first world astrology yeah first world problems of first world astrology yeah mm, well yeah. rudyard's great point was when you come to prediction and he raised the point in a sense or i'm pushing him a little bit further how to predict the past like right. where the person grew up the cultural societal conditioning the developmental psychological pressures they had because you could grow up in privilege but if your father beats you every day for the first five years of your life or from three to eight, let's say. And I work with people where this kind of thing has happened. It completely shapes the reality and the way you're going to express a certain signature in your chart uh, after an impact trauma like that is different because your uh, fundamental being is different. So yeah, there's all these factors that have to be analyzed. How to predict the past was Rudyard's kind of sly point about prediction because 
sometimes astrologers treat people like if I go for a reading, I'm 48 years old, I've already lived a chunk of my life. And people are reading the chart as if I was born 48 minutes ago or 48 seconds ago. Like it's just this completely new thing that Mark has Sag rising or Sun square Neptune or whatever. Mm. And yet I've had 48 years of living that. And surely the sensible astrologer asks about that. H how's it going? Because then you can see how astrology plays with this point. I'm developing this theory of sensitive points for certain people. People have charts where a whole thing happens around a degree cluster of one or two degrees, or it's a surprise point that just seems to have been hit in all the major transits or solar art directions of their life. Mm. And to read that is not just an astrological or theoretical principle. That's something that has to be life tested. And I think that's the big thing. The danger with these debates, remember the ESAR debate in uh, California around the election, the US election. And it's five American astrologers one night and five international another. And it was 10 to zero with the candidate that didn't make it. You know, if you abstract prediction and technique away from life, or in that case are overly influenced by life, because the polls at that point, everything looked like it would be Hillary. It's a strange one. We don't, to, to the, the idea that there's a pure astrology that happens in abstraction away from life is a dangerous one. And that's where prediction can go at times when you just make a technique, the predictive form. You know, speaking of that, um, Mark, this is a great segue. Um, I, I love what you guys have been sharing. Uh, I, I, I kind of talk about that as well as using astrology for excuses for bad behavior. We, we do that a lot in our own charts. Even uh, I, I, know, I know astrologers who, who teach what you're saying, but in private, they'll say, oh, gosh, yeah, I'm having the Saturn transit today, you know. Um, but anyway, I, I, I wanted to segue a little bit into um, uh, a topic I've been wanting to bring onto the podcast for a while, which is uh, the problem with negative prescriptions. Because um, as we kind of head into the summit and we're, we're kind of talking about what could unfold in the future, um, people are going to hear um, negative stories, dark stories, because all, you know, all of us, you, yourselves included, we talk about light and shadow expressions of, of life unfolding, because that's what unfolds, <laughs> light and shadow. It's not just all light, you know, so we can't just put a happy face on our lives or on astrology. But in the, in the course of doing that, um, because of our, our own negativity bias, a lot of us will kind of glom on to the negative um, news, so to speak, and they'll be hearing some negative news in the summit. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the problem of negative pres prescriptions from, from the uh, perspective of, um, you know, I've been reading Joe Dispenza's book, You Are the Placebo. And so when a doctor says, well, uh, we've done the tests and you've got three months to live, so you better get your affairs in order. Um, and uh, sometimes people do uh, die in that time frame, and sometimes people don't. Um, sometimes people make big changes in their lives and for whatever reason um, they don't die. Maybe they don't die at all. Maybe they heal the thing that was on, that was, you know, so-called unhealable. But, um, but there are some people who uh, get the negative prescri prescription and maybe the uh, test that the prescription is based on was wrong or faulty and they still, um, their body still reacts as if as if uh, the doctor's negative prescription was right. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts about um, that in the context of astrology and as negative news is being shared, how do you think people can kind of avoid that trap of um, uh, taking too much to heart the negative potentials? Well, um, if I just say one thing that the idea of the placebo effect to me, I was once gonna lead a campaign to change that name because it's an unfortunate reduction. You know, it's used as this critical point, like um, a negative factor in double bind or triple bind drug trials. But it's actually basically saying the healing power of belief or the healing power of an aspect of the soul. You know? And it's unfortunate that it's reduced by contemporary society because the placebo effect, which in antidepressant use is just phenomenal. I mean, studies show it's only a one or two percentile difference between actually receiving citalopram sale you know, uh, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor and a placebo. So it's just phenomenal, the power of it. And it's people's inner, it's the marshalling of your inner reserves, of, you know, the inner resources of your own psyche. And it's an unfortunate reduction to call that the placebo effect. It, it shows how our society thinks of that power. Um, 
I mean, one thing I just say is don't take astrologers too seriously. You know, they are, they're just like ordinary people like you. If astrologers were so, if astrology was so powerful, right? How come astrologers aren't just way more successful, <laughs> amazing people sometimes, you know? I mean, no, I say that as a joke, you know, but don't take it too seriously. Find your own relationship to it. Certainly, you've got to listen to these people. And, and the one advantage, when Tony and the Astrology University do something like this, there's a certain kind of quality control, which is good. You know, and it, it makes us feel good about taking part in it. But even with that quality control, you've got to listen to what people are saying and make a conscious act of discrimination about what they're saying. Don't just assume because they're experienced astrologers, they know everything or they've got all parts of their life together because, you know, I've met most of them and they haven't, believe me, you know, we haven't. We're just people living our lives like you are. So don't make too much of it. Listen with interest, engage. And then do your own research, test it in your own lives. Don't just believe people and, and be fed on that level like a, a child, you know, receiving that. No, be dynamic, you know. That's what I'd say. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I agree. I, I think that we, it's that Jupiter phenomenon of the astrologer as, um, as a guru. And um, sometimes astrologers encourage that, other times they don't, but they receive it. Um, I think... Uh, any consultation that doesn't have some sort of dialogue, as Mark was saying earlier, um, of really finding out what the client needs, where they're at, their past, um, what they want out of their lives, what they want out of the consultation, I think it's key. And people uh, coming to just have a read, read me, tell me what's going to happen or tell me about my chart. I, I think I did that when I typed up readings at the age of 16 and 17 for clients in other parts of the world. I'd sit there and type up and I was very hit and miss. And I was very aware that I was dealing with my, in my limited interpretation of something and rather than looking at their lives and what they've accumulated. And I don't think I've ever had a consultation that didn't teach me something about the expression of that chart, what the person's done with their lives and uh, and um, and you know, how the planets work in different ways. I had a client recently. Um, I must. It must have been. Um, gosh, almost a year ago. Uh, probably actually August of last year. And I was doing a talk on forecasting, looking at how each of the planets has uh, said something about an um, area of forecasting, how we can work with those planets to make the most of that particular phase. And uh, she, this, this um, lady came up to me, a very nice lady, came up to me at the end and said, I'm too old really to have a reading, which immediately I, I wanted to say, no, you're not. You know? <laughs> uh, life begins at whatever age you wanted to begin at. And... Um, she said, oh, I'm, I'm coming up to, I'm, I'm 70, I'm coming up to 71 or 72, she said, and, but I'd really love to, to see what you have to say about my chart. I said, well, give me a call. And we had a, ended up having a consultation um, over, the, over Skype. Uh, and we were looking at the different transits ahead, et cetera. And uh, she was very spiritual, very interested in, in developing that area, had developed it for a number of years. So we focused on her spiritual development, the next uh, phase of her life. And we looked at some of the tough transits coming up, et cetera, and we, I found ways of expressing them according to what she needed and where she was going. And I had news uh, about two months later that she had died suddenly in a car crash the day before her 72nd birthday. And it really reminded me of uh, you know, the first thing you want to do as an astrologer is to go back and try and find it in the chart. And then you realize that um, all those transits you've seen before when people haven't had car crashes, when they haven't had um, serious accidents, etc., And you can try and find an excuse for it or reason for it. And that's part of our mentality sometimes as a community is to run back, look at the chart and almost try to prove to ourselves that what we were looking at was it's right. a retroactive it's a refitting isn't it yeah we go back and we prove after yeah it's such a good point and we're so um desperate to see that we could have seen it and i don't think for a moment i could have done and had i done what would i have said could i have said avoid the day before your birthday with cars i couldn't have said that i'm not a psychic um and and it, it raises a lot of questions when you have people who don't fulfill the potential you've been discussing or don't live 
X number of years to do the things they wanted to do. And so um, it's a reminder, it's a humbling reminder of what we can do and what we can't. So, so brilliant. I mean, the people listening to this, I mean, soak this up in a way. <clears throat> Frank, you're so honest and you share, this is a man with a 30 years experience, you know, runs an astrology school, an internationally recognized astrology school, and is a very experienced consultant. And he can share in this real way, you know, a real humility in the face of life's mystery and what happens to the people that, that Frank clearly cared about this lady and what mm -hmm. he'd shared with her. And yeah. this, is, this is what we need more of, this kind of truth telling and this real way of holding people. We're, we're all human in this. And, and this divide between astrologers and the students is to some extent unreal, but, but there are real professional developments. The 30 years of work Frank's done or the work I've done, they count for something. But it doesn't make us in a special category. It doesn't place us outside of the human. We all bow to the mystery of life. Yeah. Or, or we fail to, and then life brings us to our knees. You know, that's part of what it is to be human, isn't it? It's the existential dimension of this gig of being human. I just think it's really good for students, in my view, to hear someone of Frank's experience and enormous professional standing be as honest and as real about these dynamics. There's no intellectual hiding in that in that kind of way. It's just a human experience. You share with someone, and then they're gone. And we could all be gone, guys. I mean, that's the, the great thing the Buddhists say, isn't it? You know? It's like it could be any moment and it does keep you on your toes i try to do every reading i try to do every client consultation like like it might be my last you know i try to be real about every single one i do even if it's late in the day even if i've done a long week or a long day of them because it's that person's life and it's the preciousness of that life you know the preciousness of the individual life even though poof, it's gone in a moment it's yeah. gone in a stupid car accident yeah yeah Tennessee Williams choked to death on a toothpaste cap. Mm. But no, he, you know, and then uh, Hart Crane jumped off a boat. Just, just beautiful poets and playwrights. Just people die. People throw that preciousness away or it's taken from them. And yet in a consultation, we have the chance to honor that, don't we? All of astrology could be about honoring the preciousness of that in individual life impulse that came through that unique moment in space and time in that unique context of that person. Uh, then it feeds the sacred individuality of people and of life, it seems to me. Yeah. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, that might be a good place to close unless you have any closing comments you wanted to share, Frank? Uh, no, just um, I, I look forward to, to hearing what everybody says at the, at the summit to get back to the reason why we're talking as well, because uh, as an astrologer, as a student, as an eternal student, you never stop learning from people. And I think at the last summit, I had you laughing, Tony, because I kept appearing. Even at three o'clock in the morning, I was still listening to somebody's talk, and I kept, I kept turning on and, and watching that. Um, it, um, I'm, yes, you, the moment you feel like you know enough is is a dangerous moment, and probably a good moment to take a year out and and I don't know, go and. Um, uh, work with pigs on a farm or something like that. Do something very, very physical. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, the, yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning from everybody, getting their points of view. And there's some great, great names, uh, people that I, I, I respect on there who, uh, who do great work. So I'm looking forward to that. So thanks, Tony, for, for including us. Oh, thanks, Frank. I love seeing that. I love seeing when, um, when you folks, uh, when, uh, professional astrologers attend each other's talks and uh, just because of what you said I, I think it is important to keep the language alive um, one, of, one of my favorite um, examples of that was the, the late Jeff Jower who used to um, at every Norwalk he would attend as many lectures as he could and then in his Saturday night talk he would weave together what was what was being alive and shared in the moment in the conference into this beautiful kind of you know in the moment presentation and uh I, I i just love that because it's not just about i mean it is about learning from each other but it's also just about being present to what, what each other is sharing and and having respect for that i think I, I so i just love seeing that um so i love seeing you pop in frank that was <laughs> oh well it's my birthday that weekend so maybe i won't quite pop in <laughs> okay <laughs> And my anniversary the next day, so maybe I'll I'll um, catch up in the in the. You can watch the you can watch the recordings later. <laughs> All right, yeah. Please go have a fun birthday. Um, well, thanks, 
Thanks, guys, for joining me today. It has been a real treat and a pleasure, as always. Um, really great conversation and so much food for further thought there and further discussion. So um, if you folks are interested in attending the summit again, it is going to be held April 13th and 14th. 2019. Uh, and if you're tuning in after those dates, you can still head over to astrologyuniversity.com forward slash summit and uh, sign up there and get the recordings. Um, if you're tuning in before then, that's you can use that same link to sign up for the summit. The summit's actually free to watch live. So if you sign up, all it's going to require is your name and your email address. You just pop that in and you'll be able to, uh, you'll get instant instructions about how to watch, how to join us live. Um, and we have uh, several lectures each day. So uh, we have lectures for every time zone. So we have some that start early in the morning, some that start finish uh, start later at night um, here in the United States. And so if you're in um, the UK or if you're in Australia or um, any other part of the world, there's there's some some time um, some lecture that you can catch for sure. So uh, if you can't attend, um, you can also get the all access pass, which includes all of the recordings as well as some extra recordings. So uh, for instance, Ray Grassi uh, is going to be sharing an extra talk that's only included as part of the bonus package. Um, and then we also have talks from uh, Jason Hawley and Karen Hamaker Zondag, which are also part of um, an additional bonus package that we have in there. So click through all those links that you see to read a little bit more about that when you're signing up, if you're interested in those. So Frank's lecture is gonna be titled uh, The New Age Jupiter and Saturn in Aquarius, and you can catch Frank live on Saturday morning here in the United States at 9 a.m. That's Pacific time, so you can head over to like a time, time date calculator online if you want to convert that into your time. So it's 9 a.m. Pacific time for Frank, and then Mark will be joining us. He'll be starting out uh, headlining Sunday at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, uh, Sunday, April 14th. Um, so if you want to catch Mark live, you can tune in then. And then we have um, several other amazing astrologers, Lynn Bell, Lawrence Hillman, Kelly Surtees, Grace Morris, Jessica Murray. Uh, I'll be presenting something as well. Uh, Melanie Reinhart, Hadley Fitzgerald, Nick Dagan Best, uh, Demetra George, and Stephen Forrest. So quite the amazing lineup. So I hope you can tune in. Um, well, thanks again, folks, for... Um, oh, Frank, I was going to have you just say one more thing um right after the summit i think the next week you're starting a forecasting course right with us That's right. Uh, yes yes a complete forecasting course with a certificate and everything if you want it and uh, really tackling a lot of the uh, a lot of the techniques but also really um giving you a, a pretty solid method to tackle uh, any any forecasting um method you wish yeah yeah so it's like if you want to see um how frank would teach forecasting in the context of everything he just said. So holding holding space for um, all of that complexity and yet still engaging the techniques of astrology in a really powerful and profound way. Um, you can definitely tune in to check out his course, which starts April 23rd. Um, you can find out in information about the course and all those details and how to sign up at Astrology University as well. You'll find a link right now on the homepage. If you're tuning in maybe a month later, you can head over to underneath programs you can click course uh, catalog and you'll find his course listed there. It's called the professional forecasting in astrology certificate course. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and close out the podcast and um, thanks so much for joining us folks. And we hope to see you soon at the summit. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, thanks Mark. <laughs> we'll see y'all soon. Take good care, everybody. <laughs>